this guy. And this guy here. One of my favorite characters in all of anime. Even keel, kicks butt, and climbs towers? Howdy folks, in this video we're going to be exploring Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball. Specifically, the parts of the world that may be even more unrealistic than Goku smashing mountains and manifesting laser beams. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Now I know what you're thinking. Dragon Ball is not exactly known for its realistic physics, or even much of an interest in architecture or the built environment. I mean, look at these nice, easy to draw, round buildings. Toriyama's drafting team must have liked that. For the most part, cityscapes or individual places aren't really given much attention, except when they're being destroyed. As such, buildings often operate as a measuring stick for the strength of the show's characters. Despite all this, I did want to talk about at least one piece of the anime that I think serves as a nice jumping off point for what I'd like to do on this channel, which is to look at examples of engineering and architecture from all sorts of fantasy and see what we can learn from them. When I was 10 years old, I used to go to this comic book store at my local mall, usually to buy packs of DBZ cards, you remember. And eventually I wandered over to the comic book section and pulled out a Dragon Ball comic with chapters focusing on Goku's trip to Korin's tower. So what was it that I was reading about? Really briefly, Korin's tower is first introduced to us in the Red Ribbon Saga of the Dragon Ball series. Here at the base of the tower, Goku meets Upa and Bora while on his quest to find the four-star Dragon Ball. Soon after, the Red Ribbon Army's mercenary Tao shows up, murders Bora, and knocks out Goku, taking his Dragon Balls. Goku wakes up and, saved by the four-star Dragon Ball hidden in his shirt, and realizes he needs to get a lot stronger in order to battle Tao and get the rest of his balls back. Luckily for him, legend has it that at the top of the tower there is a sacred water that is said to increase the strength of those who drink it. Goku takes the challenge, and after three days, finally makes it to the top. Here, he struggles with our cat-faced hermit Korin to drink the sacred water, who will only let him do so if he's able to catch him. After a few more days, Goku finally gets the best of the cat and takes his sip of what turns out to be tap water. But still, Goku hops down the tower and proceeds to kick mercenary Tao all around the forest, clearly having gotten stronger in the process of tackling the tower, and gets his Dragon Balls back. It's a fun story, and Goku and the Z Fighters return to the sacred cat tree every now and then to get Sensu Beans, the ultimate in regenerative medicines. And there's a lot of lens to look at this allegory through. I think it would be cool to know, though, how tall is Korin's tower? Well, does Toriyama tell us? Uh, no, not exactly. The Daisenshu Story Guide has the tower standing at over 8,000 meters in height, but maybe a better question is, how tall could it be? I mean, it just looks too thin, right? We're saying that she's maybe too thin, she's taking her diet a little too far. Ridiculous. But is the booty still there? Wait. Yeah. That's all we need to know about. Yes. Good point. Does Korin's tower have the capacity to resist loads? And here's where we shoehorn in the engineering. So a structural design is usually performed using some combination of the following. Applying loads on a bounded geometry and designed with materials. So loads are typically applied either in the vertical direction, in the case of the dead weight or the occupancy, and in the horizontal direction, and we'll talk about those a little bit more in, in a bit. The geometry here is probably the easiest. Uh, <laughs> it's a stick in the ground, like a flagpole. Uh, Maybe more technically, a, a vertical cantilever, a freestanding column, really, take your pick. Either way, it's a single member that is free to move and rotate at one end and is completely fixed at the other. The way that a designer might typically approach the analysis of a column is to use Euler's buckling equation. Euler derived this equation using beam theory to assess the maximum load that a vertical member under compression could take before buckling or becoming geometrically unstable. However, one of the limits of Euler's buckling equation is that the column should neglect its own weight. Unless we had a weightless material, most of the weight of the tower would come along its 8,000 meter height rather than the comparably small dome at the top. But Euler tried to analyze vertical columns like Korin's tower with another approach. 
the self-buckling equation. Here he tries to answer with the maximum height that a column could stand with no additional load before simply buckling under its own weight. However, it took another 100 years for Alfred Greenhill to correctly derive the equation. Oh, nice equations you have there, guys, but some of these factors you have are going to be heavily driven by the material, for which most structural engineers means concrete, steel, and wood. But within even these broad categories, there are lots of decisions within each material type that could be made to influence each of these factors. But let's leave that for another time. Even still, Euler and Greenhill's mathematics still wouldn't exactly represent corns, right? We have both self-weight and a load at the tip. Oh, that's right. The way that wind affects structures is a pretty complex topic. In the ASCE Guide for Loads on Structures, there is one chapter, or really just one table, for the variation in load expected from occupancy, like classrooms or hospitals, and four whole chapters on wind. That said, let's see if we can brush across the surface. In building design, the force of the wind on a structure is approximated as the square of the wind speed, and it applies a pushing force on one side and a suction force on the opposite. So if we can figure out the wind speed profile along the height of Corrin's tower, then we can reasonably estimate the wind force on it. So wind speed generally increases with height as the lack of obstructions like trees or other buildings stop disturbing the free flow of wind. The region that basically all buildings reside in is what we call the boundary layer, and it exists within the first 1,000 meters of the ground. Above that, the flow of air is much less turbulent. Think of the jet streams that speed up or slow down your flights depending on which direction you're headed. These jet streams occur anywhere from 7,000 to 12,000 meters above the ground surface and can provide wind speeds in the range of 400 miles per hour on a regular basis. All of what I've described would be a reasonable method for determining the static loading of the wind on a building. But of course the wind is dynamic and random and thus the response is dynamic. If this is not well understood, thin structures can end up with unwanted resonance. Using even these crude methods of analysis discussed, how tall could Korn's tower really be? Making some quick judgments, let's look at a steel cylinder, a common building material in a shape that sort of resembles the tower. A tower that is... Uh, eight feet in diameter? <laughs> That's the tricky part with animated architecture. Uh, buildings tend to be a bit less dimensionally stable than we experience them. Anyways, that'll fill some of the blanks in our equations, but our steel cylinder is not very impressive. But what if we use the strongest material known, graphene, which is five times stronger in compression and more importantly, five times stiffer than steel. Again, the 8,000 meter goal seems out of reach. But in the anime, they do actually tell us what the building material is. It's Heavenstone, which I get to say is an ideal rigid material because no one can tell me that it's not. <laughs> so by rigid, I mean that the material stiffness is literally infinite and usually it would be assumed to be weightless as well, which is essentially what we would need in order to provide an adequate structure. But let's say we have a heaven stone shortage affecting the supply chain. How light or stiff would a material need to be in order to reach 26,000 feet? Uh, back calculating from Oilers and Greenhill, we would need a material that's 4 million times stiffer than steel to satisfy Oilers and more than 20,000 times stiffer than for Greenhills. And recall that these are both unconservative estimates that don't even account for wind loads. Though, perhaps magical world that it is, there is a force field preventing wind on the tower, and that's actually more of a reasonable leap considering Goku and Korin would otherwise consistently need to brace for the heavy breezes up in the stratosphere. Okay, so now that structural analysis has given us some data, let's have a bit more fun. How tall would a rock climber say that the tower is? So in the manga, both Goku and Master Roshi climbed the tower over the course of three days. If we make a guess at how fast they were going, we could hypothetically draw out another data point. Obviously, Goku and Roshi are superhuman, and one way that Toriyama tells us this in a measurable way is with a 100 meter race performed in an early chapter that clocks Goku in at 8.6 seconds and Master Roshi at 5.6. So let's say our Kame house boys could climb the tower at approximately the pace of the fastest people alive. How fast are they? 
Well, based on some of the speed record climbs across the world, the average is about 24 feet per minute, or 0.3 miles per hour. That sounds slow, but if Goku hits this pace for his three day long trip up the tower, it would be over 20 kilometers in height. Though Goku did climb the tower a second time in about three hours, and given that data, the tower would be a little bit over one and a half kilometers in height, and this bounds our answer to a better degree. Awesome. So we've sort of successfully reviewed a couple of aspects of the design of Korin's tower. Briefly looking out at the wide world of fantasy art and architecture, Korin sort of stands alone in many respects. Of course there are other tall buildings depicted in media, but often there is an explicit function involved, a corporation or government building, but Korin's operates differently in that it's rather like an observation tower for the gods. In fantasy, there is one influential piece of media that comes to mind, and that's Star Wars Cloud City. And this makes some sense, as Toriyama is said to be a Star Wars fan. While they look similar from a distance, their structures and functions are pretty removed from one another. In fact, Cloud City doesn't even have an Earth to support it, just hovering in the atmosphere of a gas giant. But back to reality, we have tried to build this on an occasion or two. Toronto's CN Tower is 1,800 feet tall and built with a post-tension concrete core. The Dallas Reunion Tower is only 560 feet tall, and even here we can see that the engineers buttressed the sides of the slender core with outrigger walls. Often the structural design of these slender buildings has impacted the architectural expression. For example, by attempting to reduce the wind loads with aerodynamically efficient shapes, we get buildings that look like the Shanghai Tower and the Burj Dubai. Ultimately, the analysis of Corin's tower is more of an exercise in talking through the thought process of an engineer and the tools they might use to approach a structural engineering problem, because the actual feasibility of something like this would wholly miss the point of Goku's story, for which in order to reach his goals of becoming stronger, he aims at the highest height there is, and simply through the aim and full effort, he is rewarded through the journey rather than the end goal itself. Looking back on my experience reading my first manga makes me laugh. Part of the reason I read the chapters relating to Corrin Tower so many times is that I missed the note at the beginning that said, this book reads from right to left. It made a lot more sense when Goku was climbing up the tower and not down. But if only 10 year old me were to know that I'd be talking about Dragon Ball on the internet, I think he'd be pretty happy about that. Anyways, thanks for watching. I appreciate you for taking the time to engage with it. I had a lot of fun making this video. I know we only just touched the surface on each of these very technical topics, but I hope you found it interesting. If there's something that you want to know more about, please leave it down in the comments, and if you liked the video, smash that like button. I'm told the algorithm monster likes that. And if you didn't like it, hit it twice for good measure. Thanks, and have a good one.